Now we want to turn our attention here to the ongoing genocide in Gaza, the broader issues surrounding Palestine as we get ready to move into land day uh, here on March 30th, an important day on the calendar for the Palestinian people and the Palestinian solidarity movement. And we are very honored to be joined here on the show once again by Leanne Sima Fulahan, who is the Education Director at the People's Forum and an editor at 1804 Books. Leanne, as always, thanks for being back with us. Thanks for having me back on the show. Well, it's always an honor to have you here with us. And uh, there's a lot of places that we could start, I guess. I mean, perhaps I'll start with this. I mean, last time you were on, we were talking about the context of the ceasefire talks, which are sort of kind of still going on. But this broader issue of the perhaps so-called falling out between Biden and Netanyahu and is America starting to finally distance itself from Israel? All of this discussion is 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 raging. Uh, I mean, what do you make of this sort of political theater issue between Biden and Netanyahu? Is there a real rift here or is it just uh, surface level? Well, on the one hand, I, I do think it's just that. In, in many senses, it's political theater. Um, there, But on the other hand, it is a sign of the United States wanting to at least on the surface distance themselves from what they are assessing to be the more untenable actions of Israel in the eyes of the American public. Reports have been coming out that the majority of American people are dissatisfied with Israel's actions in uh, Gaza in the past couple of months. It's now become that the United States public is fully, basically majority and fully rejecting the U.S. policy of supporting a genocide. What that means, of course, varies from the level of understanding of each person. But what has happened is that the movement for Palestine has changed public consciousness so that there's a new status quo uh, on the streets and in, in all the workplaces, in schools, in, in discussions, and even in the media in some cases, where people are just rejecting the narrative that Israel has a right to commit genocide against the Palestinian people. There has been now in the past couple of months, the talk of invading Rafah, where over 1.1 million people are uh, suffering from famine. Um, the, the UN has come out saying that famine is looming uh, over, over, over a million people in, in Palestine. These are things that are just unacceptable, um, even by people who are not fully aware of the history of uh, the genocide and colonialism of the Palestinian people and, um, and are not fully aware of the issues. I think what happened, the political theater that we that we saw in the in last week or this past couple of days, um, is significant because we saw the United States feel that they had no other option but to abstain from the uh, from the vote uh, on the UN latest version of the UN ceasefire proposal. Um, it was the first time that they've allowed a ceasefire proposal, even though it is limited in scope, to go through the UN Security Council, and then Netanyahu's uproar against this was very dramatic. He canceled his trip to the White House, but just uh, recently it seems like they're making moves to reschedule the visit. There's not a lot of concrete evidence that the White House is trying to uh, put pressure, actual pressure on, on the Israelis, which they could do, but they are trying to at least cover up their track work uh, record in the eyes of the American people by starting to use words like ceasefire, by starting to say things like they're uncomfortable um, with with uh, the, uh, the planned invasion of Rafah, um, but they're not exactly, they're not actually doing anything to make that real. Um, it's been very interesting also to see how little effect those adoption, the adoption of the words like ceasefire has actually had. No mm. one's really been appeased by it. So in the end, it does feel like political theater, but also a sign that the movement for Palestine has been putting quite a bit of pressure on the White House. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then we had this resignation today of the State Department um, official who's, I guess, ex-State Department now. And honestly, the first thing that comes to mind when I see something like that, I mean, good for you for resigning, but why did it take you six months of genocide? Mm. Um, but specifically in it, because she, she published her reason for resigning in an article in CNN. Uh, but specifically in that piece, she mentions that the Biden administration has essentially refused to cut off the tap of weapons, even a little bit, and not just with regard to Gaza, but she actually addressed the fact that there is serious concern that Israel might want launch some sort of bigger war on Lebanon. Um, and that's not to like understate the fact that there has been an Israeli war with Lebanon since October 8th. It's just has not been anywhere near what we're seeing in Gaza, obviously. Uh, but the Israelis do 
hope to at some point be able to launch some sort of invasion and bigger war. And she noted that there's just no appetite in the Biden administration to basically cut off weapons, which essentially means that there's no real material leverage they seem to be willing to use at this point. Um, and so when the U.S. just kind of shrugs its shoulders, Leanne, and says, look, we told the Israelis to do better and we can't control what they do. There's so much the U.S. can do. Can you talk a little bit about what the U.S. can do to make this stop? I mean, the United States could make this stop. I think the fact that they are unwilling to even take one step towards that is proof enough to the world that this is not just an Israeli genocide. This is a U.S. genocide of the Palestinian people. The U.S. is not just backing it, supporting their ally in the Middle East, as they might want to say. This is a U.S. engineered project of genocide against the Palestinian people. And I think what we have to remember is that Biden and Netanyahu, for all the theater that may that Biden may try to put on and perform, that he's dissatisfied with the more grotesque kinds of statements that are coming out of Netanyahu's office, or he's dissatisfied with certain things that are coming out of the Israeli government, at the end, they're still very close because they share the same goals. Now, the goals may change slightly. The U.S. may be kind of frustrated that Israel is, seems to be willing to risk an all-out regional war at this stage. Um, U.S. has long-term goals that go beyond just the colonization of Palestine. They want to main, maintain the, the region under its full control and all of its resources. Um, and so that takes a lot more balancing, perhaps, than what Israel is showing that it's willing to do, or perhaps Israel is not exactly seeing eye to eye on certain tactical decisions and is willing to sacrifice um, much of public and international support in this moment in order to achieve what they would consider a military victory. But at the end of the day, they still have the same agenda. And so I think what we need to remember and be very clear on is that no matter what Biden or Kamala Harris or you know, ex-State Department officials or any of these other people are going to say um, who represent in different ways the institutions of the White House, the White House's project is, is in fact, the colonization and uh, the project of Israel, the colonization of Palestine and the project of Israel. Um, and it's been so from the beginning. I think there's a way in which the U.S. likes to position itself as some sort of benevolent uh, force or mediator force or the mediator of world politics, as it were, the enforcer of the, the world order. But, you know, just after they allowed this, they abstained from the vote in the U.N., Matthew Miller, Miller goes out and says that Israel hasn't committed any any crimes, any international crimes. He, they haven't done anything against that would make them want to hesitate, that would make it uh, disqualified to send weapons to them, that they actually have not committed any crimes against humanity or against the Palestinian people. Um, so you see that actually the United States is willing to continue to prop up this uh, genocidal project um, and not actually make any, any, any impacts. They could cut all weapons aid. They could call, cut all aid. They could rein in completely um, the Israeli project. They could uh, vote for an immediate ceasefire, um, and they could refuse to provide any support for the Israeli project until that is achieved. Um, and they could also force the hand of the Israelis at the negotiating table. Uh, instead, they've been pushing an Israeli agenda. Uh, we once again saw Israel run, walk out of the negotiating room and blaming Hamas for this, um, when in fact it's Israel who has been unwilling to actually negotiate an end to this uh, war on the Palestinian people. They are refusing to agree to any sort of um, agreement that would uh, that would require them to withdraw from Gaza. They they're refusing to agree to any sort of uh, conditions that would require them to stop fully stop military operations. Um, and the U.S. has done nothing to try to rein them in or to force their hand. Um, the only thing they've done is try to appease their own uh, population by saying that they're uncomfortable with it, that they want a ceasefire, and by trying to take up some of the language that the streets have been producing. Um, and it's it's not working. So, 
No, it seems the opposite is happening and that the movement continues. And I know, Leanne, that there has been a, I believe it's actually an international call. I mean, it is pretty much every year, but nonetheless, for taking on increased residence this year, especially in the United States, for people to go to the streets on March 30th for Land Day, uh, which is a very important day for the Palestinian people. I mean, if if you could maybe just give us the context of what Land Day actually is um, and then talk, if you you could, about what uh, is happening around this mobilization, what is is happening in the United States uh, in that regard. Sure. Well, Land Day is a very important day in the history of the resistance against the Zionist occupation of Palestine. Um, It originated in 1976 when Israel announced a plan to seize a further 21,000 denims of land in uh, in the Galilee, and the Palestinian people organized a general strike and a mass uprising to protest this and uh, the Zionist forces responded by assassinating six Palestinian protesters. And since then, the day um, became a commemoration of the martyrs of the Palestinian resistance, and it has developed into a day of for the world to commemorate the significance of the struggle for Palestinian land and the struggle for the right to return for all Palestinians to their land as a symbol of the struggle against colonialism and imperialism worldwide. And we've seen it every year. Um, uh, Six years ago, it was very impactful and very important to see the great march of return in in Gaza when uh, many, many Gazans, uh, Palestinian people living in Gaza marched towards the apartheid wall. um, And in this kind of Nonviolent, popular uh, mass protest uh, were uh, refusing to submit to the colonial apartheid regime and were met with live ammunition and live fire. Many hundreds were massacred. Um, and so this day has been growing in the consciousness of the world of people who are in support of the Palestinian people and who find also inspiration in the ongoing steadfastness and resistance of the Palestinian people. This year, it's even more significant, of course, because Palestine has become the issue that has woken up and has lit the fire of the movements across the world who no longer want to live under the boot of imperialism. Um, And so we're expecting massive protests on the street this year. And also because the question of, of, of occupation of land is right here on the table. There's many uh, Israeli government and politician figures who are who are looking towards now Gaza and saying that they would like, they're imagining water parks and what they can do with this land. There's settlers who are waiting to come in. Um, there's another 8,000 dunams who that have been um, seized in the, in the Jordan Valley. Uh, the question of land and the theft of land is still very active. We've seen multiple events in the United States where real estate companies are selling Palestinian land to Americans, um, to potential settlers, so and, and massive protests against them and massive uprising against them. So this year is looking like it's going to be a very, very uh, major uh, commemoration of Land Day across the world. We've seen major protests in the Arab region for days, going on days this past, this past week, um, with hundreds of thousands of people across uh, across the region out in the streets. Um, and so I don't expect that to slow down. I expect that to be even uh, more, building even uh, greater strength. In New York, we're going to be across the city. There's multiple actions planned. We're going to be at 5 p.m. at Times Square, where there's many different contingents from many different sectors of society and of the economy who have organized, who are coming out to demonstrate that the issue of Palestine is an issue for everyone. Um, And there's protests across the country and across the world. So all eyes uh, on the streets on on land day, because I think this is actually going to show what the real mood of the people is. And the reason why Biden is trying to kind of manipulate his image in many different ways, um, but also the fact that manipulations of words and vocabularies and statements is really not going to appease this movement that has not only been growing in response to the genocide, but is kind of settling in as a new status quo. People are, the consciousness is changing and they're not going to accept anything less uh, or any sort of band-aid solution uh, to the genocide of the Palestinian people. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, Leanna, after, um, a few weeks after October 7th, as this was the brutality of, of Israel's uh, behavior was becoming very, very apparent, just how bad it was going to be. Um, 
everybody was up in arms. There was protests. People were organizing, um, which was fantastic. But I remember thinking to myself, wow, this is going to be a while. And I was really worried people were going to just kind of eventually get bored with it and move on. I think the Israelis were banking on that. That has not happened. And despite the fact that the media does try to ignore what you said has become the status quo, which is these ongoing disruptions and protests. Um, but just in case there are those watching who maybe still are reading the New York Times and Washington Post and watching CNN, maybe they don't know that there's been actions going on. I'm just curious if one, you can just kind of speak to the fact that this is still continuing at a huge pace. People are still getting radicalized and coming and organizing and learning and getting involved. And also perhaps maybe how people might be able to get involved, especially like if they're, they're in New York this weekend. Well, we could talk for hours about why this mass movement has lasted for so long, um, because it's really incredible. I think many people shared your fear, Rania, that this would be kind of a movement in reaction to the horrors of the genocide. And then as people got used to it, and uh, perhaps it became normalized in the media, that it would slow down. And the opposite has happened. And it shows, I think, the weakness of the U.S. and Israeli strategy towards legitimizing this kind of genocidal occupation and violence that somewhat worked in the past, but never really worked. I mean, there's there's also the, the, the reality of this is that it's the Palestinian resistance that has kept this going because they have not only maintained, uh, uh, not allowed Israel to achieve its military goals, um, but they have shown that a very small blockaded and occupied people are capable of withstanding and uh, making advances against the greatest military powers on, on the earth today. This, I think, is we can't underestimate the impact that this is going to have on oppressed people across the world. And the imperialist forces, U.S., Israel, and all their allies consistently make the, the mistake of underestimating the strength of people and the strength of the movements against the oppression that they themselves are enacting. Um, and this has happened time and time again throughout history. I think what is very significant is that it has reached the American public. Uh, the American public who has gone through multiple economic crises, has gone through multiple mass uprisings in the past 10 years, um, every single time gaining political experience and gaining clarity about what the White House and its project actually represents for their day-to-day -day life, which isn't very good, um, is fed up with being fed lies and having uh, acts of extreme violence being carried out in their name. And so I think we've seen a combination of factors that has made it so that the movement for Palestine is being sustained now in many different ways across many different sectors with many different kinds of tactical uh, and creative actions. Mass mobilizations have not slowed down. Um, they have been happening on a, at least a weekly basis in most major cities across the United States. This in itself is an achievement. But besides that, there is no way that any politician can go anywhere without being disrupted on the question of Palestine. No, Biden can't even campaign anymore. Um, today, actually, uh, there's a fundraiser for Biden um, that's going to be attended by Obama and Bill Clinton at Radio City in um, New York City. And as we speak, there are people mobilizing all around Radio City, gathering, getting ready to disrupt and be on the streets and make their voices heard. There's no way that they're going to accept that these three major political figures who represent to them the biggest war criminals are going to be able to be welcomed into New York and fundraise uh, without disruption. But even at a small scale, um, a city councilor that wants to speak to the public that hasn't called for a ceasefire is being disrupted. Um, any business, any corporation that wants to, that hasn't, that is complicit in the cr crimes of uh, the Israeli project uh, is having a campaign against them. Their workers are writing statements. There's a huge diversity of actions happening. Um, and it can be hard to get a grasp of all of it. But one way that you can get involved is to check Shut It Down for Palestine. Uh, dot org. That's uh, shut it down for with the number dot for Palestine dot org um, to find mobilizations and actions in your area uh, to look for the Palestinian youth movement or the answer coalition uh, on Instagram and Twitter and to find different actions that you can get involved in. The People's Forum hosts uh, 
mass volunteer meetings open to the public every Monday night at the People's Forum in New York City so people can join. Um, and people can submit their own actions to the Shut It Down for Palestine website to, so that other people can connect to them. The truth is, is that people have taken this on of their own accord. And that's been true since the beginning of this movement. It's a self-acting movement that has grown um, and it has grown, uh, has has created new organizations. It has strengthened people. It has given people new skills. And none of this is going away. People are not backing down and I think are feeling themselves to be uh, empowered and real agents of change in this uh, current time, especially when it's very clear that the White House is being backed into a corner by the movement and their options uh, for maintaining some sort of legitimacy in the public eye are rapidly decreasing. So this is the time to be on the streets and I think everybody is feeling that and many people are taking it upon themselves to not only be out there, but to build the pressure. Leanne Foulihan, Education Director at the People's Forum and Editor with 1804 Books, 1804books.com. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us here on The Freedom Side. Thank you for having me.